Greetings. Thank you for tuning in to the Lessons of the Vietnam Show. Here we strive to tell the real story of the Vietnam War and the men and women who served in it. It's important to us to dispel the myths, mistrust, mistruths, and misunderstandings of the war and its participants. I am Bill Dixon, Vietnam veteran, 1967-68, TED survivor, and your host for the show. We broadcast from the Raleigh, North Carolina studios of Nissan Communications, who gives us the opportunity to tell the real story of the Vietnam War. Throughout the show, you are welcome and encouraged to participate with uh, me, and when we have guests, of course, them. Uh, we'd like your comments, questions, or so forth. Just call in or use Skype. You can see the address and everything there on the screen. Uh, and let us and be part of the show. Ask questions, make comments, please. If uh, if nothing else, let us know if we did something wrong. I uh, won't because it's important that we get out the right information and so forth. And there's so much crazy information out there. Uh, so tonight's show is a very special show for all of us animal lovers. Um, I have a dog at home that's like my uh, uh, shadow. Everywhere I go, she's going. Tonight shows the dogs of war, uh, primarily about the dogs in Vietnam. As you see back on, go back on that other screen. Went out just a minute, so there, there you go. As you see on the screen there, our uh, information about the uh, veterans crisis line. You know, this past week we had two. We'll call them celebrities because that's what everybody else has called them. Uh, committed suicide, and I feel for them, and I feel sorry for their family. But you know, they tell me that twenty veterans a day commit suicide and you hardly you don't hardly hear any news about it at all here's two people who've done well in their lives uh made money taken care of their families committed suicide for whatever their reasons were uh uh and they get all this uh, uh publicity and so forth and how terrible it is well it's just as terrible for those 20 who served our country maybe even more so so if you are out there and you're a veteran or know a veteran uh, and you feel yourself in a crisis or feel them coming in, no, they're coming in a crisis, please ha encourage them to reach out to the uh, crisis line there. And uh, let's see if we can cut that down. Thank you. By the way, uh, this is a little extra here. Uh, tomorrow is a special day. It's uh, June 14th. Also, it's also Flag Day. Flag Day is a celebration of adoption of the American flag by the Continental Congress in the first flag resolution of June 14, 1777. Although the 200-year anniversary of this date was celebrated by flying flags on public buildings and holding remembrances in several cities, Flag Day was an official recognized until President Harry Truman signed it into law in 1949. Soon after Flag Day became official, another law passed requiring the state superintendents of public schools to make sure patriotic holidays like Memorial Day, Flag Day, Lincoln's Birthday, and Washington's Birthday are observed in schools. Now, I didn't know that, that they were uh, was required to uh, be observed in schools. I wonder how many principals didn't know that. Now we're going to get into the uh, uh, Vietnam Dogs of War. Uh, the... Um, uh, we had uh, a lot of dogs that served our country uh, very well. Uh, as you'll see as we go on, they saved thousands and thousands of lives uh, in the process of doing, uh, of doing their job. They were very loyal, uh, loving, uh, give their lives uh, too often, quite often, to, uh, sell, uh, to uh, protect and serve the people, their handlers and the people they were working for. Now, starting off with, uh, you see there, uh, this is Sergeant Stubby. There's a movie just came out about Sergeant Stubby. Since World War I, military working dogs have been used. They are generally referred to as war dogs, but the correct term is military working dogs. There were many breeds of dogs used in the beginning, but through the experience, the German Shepherd and Doberman were selected, and later the Doberman was replaced with a Labrador. Uh, they would take just about, I mean, just about any breed of dog has been used uh, for uh, the military working dogs. Uh, this one says, in World War One, I, I saved my unit. They gave me a medal. Now the country I serve wants to destroy my kind. Rest in peace, Sergeant Stubby, 1917 and 1925, America's first and most decorated war dog. Okay. 
Of the 10,425,000 do dogs trained in World War II, around 9,300 used for sentry duty. Sentry dogs were issued to hundreds of military organizations such as coastal fortifications, harbor defense, arsenals, ammunition dumps, airfields, depots, and industrial plants. The largest group of sentry dogs, 3,174, were trained in 1943 and issued to the Coast Guard for beach patrols guarding against enemy submarine activities. Uh, by the way, since we're talking about the Coast Guard, on the Vietnam Memorial Wall, there are seven uh, uh, members of the um, United States Coast Guard listed on the wall. So they, uh, they served their uh, duty in, in Vietnam. Over the centuries, dogs have many roles with the military, but in modern times, specific duty has been defined where dogs can give the best service. In other words, like anything else, uh, we've gotten specialized. Uh, Certain breed of dogs or, or certain temperament dogs are used in one way and then another dogs are trained another way. While in the past they have done everything from catch rats to draw fire to expose enemy positions, today dogs are given humane tasks where their special skills do the most good. And I'm not certain about the word humane task uh, as we go into the stories and so forth, uh, but we'll go along with what uh, the experts said it was anyway. Okay. To be, can you click on another thing in there? Just there you go. Among the dog's abilities that far exceed a man is his sense of smell. And with a nose like that, he ought to be able to smell. Uh, dogs are reported to have 10 to 20 times the number of receptors in their nose compared to a human in the olfactory part of their brain. The ability to smell is much larger. This gives them the ability to detect even faint odors and to discriminate between very slight differences in chemical compositions. Looks like a St. Bernard nose. They have saved countless lives and casualties since the beginning of their military service and continue to do so today. Sometimes they're priced, but they seem to be willing to pay. As you can see there, they're carrying a wounded dog. Uh, the other dog there is actually wounded also, even though he looks like he's dead, he is wounded. We're going to actually talk a little bit about him before the show's over with. Uh, but he was wounded and uh, getting ready to go into uh, get to see the vet. So, Vilt Vietnam and the military working dog. Records of the war dogs were not kept by the military before 1968. 3,747 dogs confirmed with records by a tattoo, usually on their left ear. That's how they could keep up with them with their number. It is estimated that 4,900 dogs served in Vietnam from 1964 to 1975. It, believed that, it is believed that more than 10,000 lives were saved by the dogs and their handlers. That's a lot, that's a lot of men uh, in the process of uh, the dogs been out there. Dog handlers. Vietnam, with 10,000 handlers serving, was the largest use of handlers and their dogs in any combat situation by the United States. Of the 10,000 men who served with canine units during the Vietnam War, more than 265 were killed in action. During the Vietnam War, all four branches of the military used dogs. And you break it down by the branches, is Army, 65%, Air Force, 26%, Navy, 2%, and Marines, 7%. And we'll talk a little bit about what they did and so forth as we go on. Okay. Missions of the dogs and their handlers varied in Vietnam and how they were trained in branch of service. The scout dogs. A scout dog team usually consisted of one German shepherd with their handler. Saw a lot of those. The team worked with the infantry by walking point out in the front of the unit looking for enemy ambushes, booby traps, snipers, and flashes of food and weapons. Scout dogs could detect the presence of an enemy at distance up to a thousand yards long before the men became aware of them. The combat tracker teams. As you can see there, they're uh, Labrador retrievers. A uh, tracker team consisted of a Labrador or sometimes a shepherd with the handlers, a cover man, a visual tracker, and a team leader. The team was called on to track either visually or with the dog. They may be tasked to follow a blood trail at an ambush. Uh, if you want to uh, find the ones that uh, the enemy that got shot, he would follow the uh, uh, blood trail or a body odor or an airborne scent, just basically uh, scent in the air, and to help find, to help find the enemy. And it also were used for uh, finding uh, downed pilots or wounded Americans after battles. 
so forth. So that's what they were used for. Sentry dog teams were universal within every branch of the U.S. military. Sentry dogs, Air Force sentry dog teams in Vietnam and Thailand were normally Air Force military police units. And the dog that you saw a while ago laying on the stretcher, stretched out, uh, was one of the Air Force uh, dogs. Sentry dog teams were the first line of defense on the bases, ammo depot, the pots, the pots, the pots. Yeah. I want to get my brain, my military, my southern brain sometimes is slow there. Uh, flight lines, supply areas, communications areas, and such areas. The teams walk their perimeter of the location to detect, detain, and destroy any intruders. Uh, as you can see there in the background, those uh, you can't really see it there, but there's barbed wire uh, there. It's probably some container, container wire there too. Uh, generally, a team of one dog and handler work at night, and they would patrol a certain area of the perimeter, like the ammo dump at Long Bend or the uh, air base at uh, Tonsonud or uh, Benoit Air Base or Da Nang Air Base. They were patrolling uh, throughout the night. And uh, Mine dogs. They were also mine and booby trap dogs. They protected our soldiers on patrol from the many and diverse devices set to kill and maim. The Vietnamese were very, very uh, adept at building different uh, booby traps and so forth. Uh, we were told whenever we were out and we were eating sea rations and so forth to make sure you smash the cans, cut the bottoms out so they couldn't be used and so forth. And as you see here in this illustration, you take a grenade, pull the pin, and put it in the can and put a string across the um, uh, trail so when you pull, walk across, you pull the uh, string, the string pulled the uh, grenade out of the can, and the lever popped off, and in six seconds you had a big boom. As it says there, take the thin monofilament lines that were practically invisible to the human eye, which the Viet Cong attached to a grenade or other explosive device that detonated when tripped. And there was other different types of uh, booby traps and so forth used. A large proportion of American infantry casualties were caused by these devastating uh, devices, somewhat like the IEDs of today. But a trained dog could attack the trap and would be neutralized. The team consisted of one German shepherd and a handler in support of infantry and combat engineers. Their missions were detect mines, booby traps, trip wires, and tunnel complexes, as well as assist in searching villages and suspected enemy cache. I apologize for that. I'm getting over a upper respiratory infection. Okay. Tunnel dogs. Did not know there were tunnel dogs up until I put together a show. I've heard of tunnel rats where the, where the American soldiers climb down in the tunnels. In Vietnam, was a specialized requirement for tunnel dogs to actually explore the tunnels used by the Viet Cong. And as we went through the war, we also found that the Vietnam, uh, the, the communists would adapt. <coughs> I was doing good until I got to talking. They would adapt to um, whatever they could do. It's like when they um, they learned they were off right off early. The closer they get to the Americans, it would be harder for the Americans to call in airplanes or helicopters to, to shoot up uh, shoot up them at, uh, attacking the closer they get. So uh, different things as we, uh, as our tactics changed, their tactics changed, and as their tactics changed, we had to change our tactics. The tunnel dwellers feared the dogs and used tactics to confuse the dogs. For example, they washed with GI soap and covered air vents with shirts that were taken from America so the dog's sense of smell would not be alerted. Uh, I'm not certain how much soap you'd have to use to cover up nuke mom taste or smell. Uh, water dogs. There were uh, water patrol dogs. They would put a dog in front of a small boat and move around the area because the dog could pick up the scent of somebody swimming underneath the water and breathing through a hollow reed, which humans couldn't detect, or around the uh, sand pans and so forth that were hiding. The Viet Cong placed bounties on both the American handlers and their, and their war dogs. So whenever these guys went out to do their job, not only were they um, out there walking point in the in the front, uh, if anything was going to happen, 
they they had a, a there was a reward out for anybody that killed one of them. As a dog hunter, you are the first person in the patrol. You are pretty vulnerable. Behind snipers and helicopter pilots, dog handlers had the third highest mortality rate of a profession in in Vietnam. As you can see, they went right through the water with um, uh, their handlers and so forth. And uh, I guess they picked up leeches like we did. Handlers that served with war dogs would never forget their friendship and selfishness and valor. The trust and loyalty between the handler and his dog were strong. Just think about how yours, your your uh, thing with your dog, uh, how strong that is. I mean, they're part of the they've become part of the family and so forth. When the handler rotated back to the United States or was wounded and could not return to duty, the dog was assigned to another handler. Now that didn't always work out. Sometimes the dog's temperament uh, or the handler they matched them with, uh, their personalities didn't go together. Uh, but generally, they would. Um, uh, work out and, and can continue right on doing and serving what they were supposed to do. But sometimes uh, they would get the wrong handler or the dog was um, just couldn't be controlled for whatever reason. Now, the $64,000 question. Now, those of you out there here are too, are too young to remember that. It was an old TV show called the $64,000 question. It was one of the early uh, game shows. So we've always used the word with the $64,000 question. The $64,000 question is, what became the dogs of war as Vietnamization took place and the Vietnam War was winding down? Okay. I would suggest that uh, if you have high blood pressure, you might want to take something to get it down because you're going to get mad. 4,000-plus warrior dogs served the men and women who fought the Vietnam War with complete loyalty and willingness to give their life in the process. As you can see there, now that dog is a Doberman. We just talked about um, uh, the uh, Labrador Retrievers and the, and the Shepherds, and I show you a picture of a Labrador. Um, but they look like uh, uniforms from the Vietnam War, so I guess uh, Dobermans were used sometimes too. Okay. U.S. military euthanized or abandoned thousands of their own canine soldiers at the end of the Vietnam War. After the war ended, U.S. military marked their dogs as expendable surplus equipment. They were no longer considered dogs. They were expendable surplus equipment, leaving them to the South Vietnamese or euthanizing them, as you can see the many dog handlers there with their dogs. Vietnam, 1970. As the Vietnam War neared the end, the idea of going home was greatly welcomed by the troops. But some of the dog handlers were worried, what would happen to the dogs? And a number of ha uh, handlers tried to get permission to take their dogs home with them, but the military said it was afraid that dogs would carry disease, and said that no dogs were just that the dogs were just another piece of equipment. Uh, I can imagine just uh, just the frustration and excitement about going home, but uh, at the same time leaving your buddy there, and your buddy in this case was. Uh, was the dog, and knowing that uh, it probably never be able to come home. The uh, even though they were told that would bring diseases and so forth, and you couldn't, they were also told that you couldn't take a dog that was trained for war and have him to uh, reassimilate himself back into society around people and so forth. But uh, the dog handlers were told that the World Health Organization had passed a ruling said that no animals were to come out of Vietnam. Years later, the World Health Organization denied it said any such thing. So whether somebody got the, where the idea that somebody got the idea that um, uh, they would take diseases and so forth home uh, and blame the World Health Organization, uh, somewhere along the line there, someone was not exactly always speaking the truth. Now, this, this is the hard part for me. The double injustice for final disposition of the war dogs often entail the active and mandatory participation of the dog's handler. After all, no one could handle the dog without incurring injury of death because this dog was trained. The handler would be required to hold his dog, watch the needle be inserted in the animal's veins, and then feel him die in his arms. How many handlers have stressed for decades over participating in killing their own dog and still feel they betrayed a friend? 
I just recently, not too long ago, had a uh, a buddy of mine, my my Saint Bernard, who was uh, my boy, and uh, even though that uh, I knew he was going to be in a butter place because he was been real sick for a long time, uh, and it was it was the time, and I still have a hard time uh, being there with him when the vet gave him that shot, and here's a perfect healthy dog who work with this handler under uh, combat conditions and bad conditions as far as environment and so forth. And he had to sit there and hold the dog while some vet gave him the injection. I, I just come out post-traumatic stress. I don't know how those guys uh, could have done it, but as they say, war is hell. It, it, it was a set in stone policy of the United States military to not bring military dogs home to the United States from Vietnam. However, ironically, there were some 40,000 dogs that served in World War II and Korea. All the dogs physically able to end to, to at the end of the wars came home. Let me read that to you again. 40,000 dogs from World War II and Korea, if they were able to, came home. But no dogs were allowed by policy to come home from Vietnam. In late 1970, the decision was made to bring some of the dogs home, but there had to be quarantine in a special holding kennel at Long Bend Post, located 20 miles outside of Saigon. 200 dogs were selected and kept in their special holding kennel. And I drew plans for a... Um, dog kennel at Long Bend before I left there uh, in 68. Uh, I'm one of those the same one or not, probably not. In May 1971, 120 dogs, all of the remaining original 200 were picked up for shipment. Okay, out of the 4,000 dogs who served in Vietnam, 200 dogs were selected and put into kennel. 120 of those 200 were picked up and to be shipped out. 15 scout dogs were dropped off in Okinawa. 105 dogs returnees made it back to the United States to Lackland Air Force Base in Fort Benning. None were adopted out to civilians. So let me go over that again. 4,000 dogs served. 105 returned back to the United States but were kept on military bases. The dogs were turned over to the Arvins, which was the South Vietnamese. This was problematic. They already had more dogs than they could use. The dogs were big and aggressive, and the Vietnamese population tended to be afraid of them. So what likely happened to these dogs that were turned over to the South Vietnamese? Well, folks, if you look on the back of that motorcycle, it'll kind of give you an idea what happened to those dogs. They probably served the family for several days there. These were the dogs who protected our men, saved 10,000 lives, and we turned them over because we were afraid that we'd bring home the disease, which they couldn't prove one way or the other. President Clinton signed a bill in 2000 that said no military dog would be left behind. See, all those dog handlers who tried to bring their dogs home did not give up. Even though they had lost their dogs, they continued so it wouldn't happen again. So finally, the political powers that be rolled over and got Clinton to sign the bill in 2000. In Iraq and Afghanistan, when those dogs either get too old or get wounded, they're not euthanized. They are put up for adoption by their former handler. When a dog's time in the military has come to an end and the dog is ready to retire, here's how it works. The dog is first put under review. This is an involved but ex uh, expedited process that includes input from veterinarians, behaviorists, and got it to the dog's home station kennel master, the person familiar with the dog's entire career. Okay. 
they uh, make sure that he can be the most, uh, they can be domesticated back. Uh, they don't have a disease or, or whatever. When it's determined that a dog is in good health and is of suitable temperament for life as a house dog, the military reviews the candidate who wants to adopt the dog. Oftentimes, a long list of dogs, former handlers who are ready and willing to take him home. Home, in this case, being a private residence. Now, from what I understand, these guys have to pay shipment for these dogs to come home. In other words, they're not necessarily shipped back to the United States and, and then turn over to the handlers. Uh, from what I've studied and uh, so forth, that sometimes the, often the handlers have to pay for the shipment back and so forth. Now, let's talk about all these uh, hero war dogs of America. To the handlers and the men, they say that all of the dogs were are, are, are heroes, giving total loyalty and love and trust in their life to protect and serve if needed. And as you, we go into some more of their stories, you just uh, uh, how loyalty and how loving these dogs were and, and so forth. Some of the warriors stood out as superheroes. Remember the dog I mentioned a while ago on the stretcher? Well, this is him right here. His name is Nemo. One of the many dogs that served this country in Vietnam, Nemo is probably the most famous. Nemo was whipped in October 1962 and was procured by the Air Force in the summer of 64 for sentry dog training when he was a year and a half old. And I'll explain you the reason that picture is like that when, as we go. After completing an eight-week training course at Lackland Air Force Base, uh, Century Dog Training School in San Antonio, Texas, the 85-pound black and tan German Shepherd in January 1966 is when he got through training. Nemo and his handler, Airman Leonard Bryant Jr., were transported to the Republic of South Vietnam with a large group of other dog teams and were assigned to the 377th Security Police Squadron stationed at Tonsonut. And you can see their uh, two-story uh, hooches there and so forth. Uh, Tonsonut was, uh, well, at the time, was right out just outside of Saigon. Today, Tonsonut is kind of in the middle of Saigon, but that was the airport uh, port there. Six months later, in July, Nemo's original handler rotated back to the United States. The dog was then paired with 22-year-old Airman 2nd Class Robert Thornburg. On December 4th, 1966, during the early morning hours, a group of 60 Viet Cong emerged from the jungle. Several sentry dogs teams stationed on preventive perimeter posts gave the initial alert and warning almost simultaneously. In other words, they announced that, that there was somebody out there on the other side of the wire. Immediately, Rebel, a sentry dog on patrol, was released. Response was a hell of bullets that killed the dog. 45 minutes later, the group was detected by a sentry dog, Cubby. Cubby was released with the same results. He was killed. It was clear that the VC had learned to handle the attack dogs. That's the patch for the uh, 377th uh, uh, dog handle, guys. This is a picture of the battle. As a result of this early morning war warning, special forces, security forces of the 377th Air Police Squadron successfully repelled the attack and minimized damage to aircraft and facilities. Although wounded, one dog handled and maintained contact with the enemy and notified Central Security Control of their location and directions. This is members of the 307th SPS uh, who infiltrate and they're fighting the um, uh, those who've infiltrated the Tonsonut Air Base during Tet 1968. Two security policemen in a machine gun bunker, such as you have there, were, were ready and, and waiting as the Viet Cong approached the main aircraft parking ramp. In a few seconds, they stopped the enemy, killing all 13 of the attackers. Security forces rapidly deployed around the perimeter and prevented the infiltrators from escaping and forced them to hide. In other words, they were on the base, but they were uh, hiding someplace, even in the tall grass or wherever. During that period of time, three airmen and the dogs had died in the fighting. By daybreak, the search patrols believed that all the remaining Viet Cong were uh, killed or captured. In other words, they sent uh, guys out looking for those uh, to make sure they didn't need stragglers. Unfortunately, they did not include dog teams in those daylight patrols. Now, why you got all this highly trained dogs there and you know there were guys hiding 
you wouldn't send out guys with dogs. Well, it is the military sometimes. Yeah. That night, Thornburg and Nemo were assigned duty near an old Vietnamese graveyard about a quarter mile from the air base's runway. No, no sooner than they started their patrol, Nemo alerted on something in the cemetery. But before Thornburg could radio in that something opened fire. In other words, that something that Nemo uh, sensed uh, started shooting at him. Thornburg released Nemo and then, and then charged firing into the enemy. Nemo was shot and wounded. The bullet entered his right eye and ex exited through his mouth. And you can see there in the picture, uh, he no longer has that right eye. Uh, Thornburg killed one VC before he too was shot in the shoulder and knocked to the ground. Nemo refused to give in without a fight. Ignoring his serious head wound, the 85-pound dog threw himself at the Viet Cong guerrillas who had opened fire. Nemo's ferocious attack brought, the Thornburg, brought Thornburg the time he needed to call in backup forces. Although severely wounded, Nemo crawled to his master and covered him with his body. Even after help arrived, Nemo would not allow anyone to touch Thornburg. Finally separated, both were taken back to the base for medical uh, attention. Thornburg was wounded a second time on the return to the base. And there's the vets who are working on, at the time there, you see him working on uh, Nemo. That's Nemo with his uh, a tag, I guess. Or should, no telling them what medicine they'd given and so forth. The base vet worked diligently to save Nemo's life. Uh, he kind of went above and beyond. It required many skin grafts to restore the animal's appearance. Nemo was blinded in one eye. After his rec recuperation, the veterinarian felt Nemo was well enough to go back on the perimeter duty. But it turned out his wounds needed further treatment, so they had to take him off the line. On June 23, 1967, Air Force headquarters directed that Nemo be returned to the United States with honors as a first century dog to be officially retired from active service. Thornburg had to be evacuated to the hospital in Japan to recuperate. The handler and the dog who saved his life said their final goodbyes. Thornburg fully recovered from his wounds and also returned home with honors. Nemo flew halfway around the world. The plane touched down in Japan, Hawaii, and California. At each stop, Air Force vets examined the brave dog for signs of discomfort, stress, and fatigue. After all, he was a war hero, and they uh, uh, basically uh, made a big thing of him flying in. He was the hero in, in, in public and press and, and so forth. So, uh, Nemo spent the rest of his retirement at the Department of Defense Dog Center in Lackland Air Force Base in Texas. He was given a permanent kennel near the veterinarian facility. Nemo died December 1972 at Lackland Air Force Base shortly after the Christmas holiday after a failed attempt to preserve his remains. The Vietnam, the Vietnam hero was laid to rest on March 15, 1973 at the DOD Dog Center at the age of 11. As you can see, there is his tombstone. Uh, Nemo, October 6, 1962 to December 1972. Uh, 300 Special uh, Police Service, Fairchild Air Force Base, uh, Washington. I think that's what WA. Constitute Republic of Vietnam. In remembrance of Nemo and his faithful service to the United States Armed Forces, may all who hear the, the story of Nemo know the true measure of a man's best friend. And here's Sergeant Stubby. Sergeant Stubby was basically a uh, pug nose. Uh, Pugnose Bulldog or, or Pit Bull there. Uh, Stubby enlisted in the military by strange means by wandering on, on to the uh, Yale University field, uh, which was being used at the time for military training uh, as a stray. Basically, he was a homeless dog, and he started hanging around the soldiers, and, of course, they started to feed him and so forth, and he became their mascot. His stocky looks and good nature made him their perfect mascot. As you can see him there, they got him all dressed up in a, in a uniform and so forth. Sergeant Stubby, a hero dog of World War I, a brave story. Okay. Uh, that's a cover for the uh, book that was written about him and, and, the, and used for the movie, I think, also. Somehow the soldiers managed to smuggle uh, Stubby over to Europe. He wasn't a trained military dog, but they got him on the ship, 
and they fed him and took care of him on the ship. And there was, and that's when he, his heroic career began. He managed to alert soldiers to gas attacks in time for them to get their gas mask on. He captured a German spy and even saved the girl from an oncoming car. Now, <clears throat> Stubby also perished from poison, almost perished from poison gas. In World War I, uh, down in the trenches and so forth, there was a lot of gas, uh, uh, poisonous gas and so forth put out. And uh, how he survived without a mask, I'm certain they finally uh, made him a mask, especially for him. But the scrappy pit bull pulled through. After 18 months in Europe, Stubby returned home. As you can see, uh, they cared a lot about him with all the medals and, and so forth on him. Stubby died in 1926. His body is kept by the Smithsonian, uh, the Smithsonian Museum. Stubby's obituary was printed in the New York Times, April 14th, 1926. As you can see, he looks a lot like my Stratfordshire Terrier, uh, Toby. Now, here's another war dog. Wrong side, but he was a good dog. Saddle was a bridle Stratfordshire Bull Terrier. I'm very familiar with. I got one waiting for me at home who served as regimental mascot for the 11th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry during the Civil War. She was given to First Lieutenant William R. Terry as when she was just four weeks of age. Sata was raised with the men of the regiment, and they were fond of her. She needed a specific drum roll announcing Reveille. In other words, uh, she got excited and got people going uh, at Reveille. Sata followed the men closely on marches to the battlefield, always on the front lines. In the spring of 1863, at a review of the Union Army, Sally marched along with her soldiers. Abraham Lincoln sat in the center reviewing stand and spotted the dog. He raised his famous hat as a salute to the dog. At Gettysburg, Sally became separated from the 11th in all, in all the chaos. Three days later, they found Sally guarding the bodies of dead and wounded soldiers, herself unscathed. Now, we talk about the Vietnam War here. Vietnam War, we lost 58,272, which is what's on the wall now. Uh, in three days at Gettysburg, we lost right at 53,000 men. Can you imagine? And that dog was laying there guarding those, those men uh, who had looked after her, and she was looking after them. In 1865, at a hatches run, Saturday was struck by a bullet through the head. She was killed instantly. She was buried on the battlefield while under heavy enemy fire. In 1890, surviving veterans of the 11th Pennsylvania dedicated a monument on the Gettysburg battlegrounds, which contains the likeness of Sleeping Sally. Chips was a German Shepherd Collie mixed, Husky mix, excuse me, that's three different dogs, uh, ended up being the most decorated canine that served during World War II. Edward J. Wren owned Chips, but donated him to the Army. Private citizens were asked to donate their dogs to serve. In 1942, Chips began his training as a sentry dog. He traveled the world while serving with the 3rd Infantry Division, seeing North Africa, Sicily, Italy, France, and Germany. In 1943, during the invasion of Sicily, Chips and his handler were trapped on the beach by a machine gun fire. Chips broke free of his handler's grip and ran towards the fire, attacking the gunman, the gunman and eventually causing the surrender to American troops. In other words, basically, he captured the, the Germans. For his heroism, during the war, he was given a civil star, a purple heart. For those words, uh, rewards were later revoked. At that time, uh, dogs could not be given those awards. He was unofficially given a theater ribbon with the arrowhead and eight battle stars for each of his campaigns. In 1945, he returned to the Wren family. Now, this is some of the uh, different monuments that are scattered around the United States. Um, that one is, uh, I'm not certain exactly where all these monuments are, uh, but this one at the bottom says, Not Forgotten Fountain. As you can see, it, there's a fountain there. The guy's pouring water out of his uh, canteen into his helmet for his uh, war dog to drink water. An everlasting memory of all the heroic war dogs who had served, died, and were left behind in the Vietnam War. 
John Burnham, Vietnam scout, dog handler. That's a that's a very attractive uh, uh, statue there. There's some of the others. United States uh, War Dog Memorial, state of New Jersey, and I'm not certain where the one there with the soldier in the 16 uh, came from, uh, but the, both of those are are very nice uh, war dog uh, monuments and so forth. Gardens of Freedom, uh, I did know where that one's from. Uh, it actually, what it has, let's see, on the right-hand side, it's, it has two Labradors, and on the left-hand side, looking at it, it has the German Shepherd. It says, Guardians of American Freedom, Military Working, um, uh, do- working Dogs National Monument. Uh, very, very nice memorials there. And then you've got the... Um, uh, Soldier on the Trail, uh, there's your Adobeman, and uh, that's an also a nice one with the wall and the dog there. Uh, the one in the middle there with the Adobeman is actually uh, from World War II, and he saved 25, 25 uh, Marines in, in that one. Uh, that's a very attractive one uh, there, so good size wall. So forth. So. Okay, K-9 Veterans Day. Uh, did you know that March 13th was K-9 Veterans Day? I didn't, but I'm going to make a note of it so uh, I can start uh, recognizing and honoring uh, the dogs uh, on March 13th and so forth. So uh, ne- next time we do a show around March 13th, we'll have a special uh, remembrance of the, of the dogs and so forth. Okay. This show and this and the memorial here was dedicated to all war dogs and their handlers, past, present, and future. Your deeds and sacrifices will always be remembered. The United States of America and dogs we trust. A lot of men put their lives on the, on the line trusting that dog who's walking point. We're talking about Elephant grass and jungle so thick that you can't see your hand. If you put your hand out in front of you, you can't see. And you're out in front of everybody looking for that little thin fishing line across the line. Or you're looking for uh, people that you can't see in ambushes and so forth. These dogs serve their handlers. They serve their uh, the men they were working for. And to just basically turn them over to... Uh, the Vietnamese who uh, didn't want the dogs, didn't had more dogs than they wanted to do with and start with, who end up uh, being used them for others. So that's it's a happy story, but it's also a sad story uh, because now the dogs uh, who serve and we have dogs serving today, uh, they do get to come home. They are not uh, treated as surplus equipment. You know, when we left Vietnam, we left a lot of things there, trucks, cars, jeeps, weapons, and so forth. But unfortunately, we left a lot of great dogs who served our country and just because they were just another piece of equipment. I don't know how a person could have a dog and just say he's just another piece of, sur- uh, just another piece of surplus equipment, like, a, like a, a pair of boots with a hole in the bottom or something, you know, just. Uh-oh. No, the dog handlers definitely, uh, but somebody who, uh, I don't, they must not, they must not even grew up with a dog. I just, you know, um, that was our show. We, we got through a little earlier tonight, but I wanted to, uh, uh, tell you that our next show coming up will be, um, we'll have a guest and it will be on June 24th. And I guess an Arthur and Vietnam veteran and uh, it'll be John Harrison. He's the author of a book called Still Rain, the Ted Defense of 1968. Looking forward to that show. And I'm talking with uh, another gentleman who's um, uh, going to be a guest after his show. And again, anytime that the uh, shows are on, uh, if you have, if you're a veteran out there, or you know something about the Vietnam War or whatever, and you think that something we have on here that's not quite the way it should be, um, the Vietnam War is a very complicated war as far as uh, history. It was the first history, it was the first uh, battle that was fought in the, uh, on television. In other words, people were sitting down for Sunday dinner quite often and saw the Vietnam War. Uh, 
wall protesters were a little bit uh, more vocal than some of the others. Uh, they said things and protested and, and made comments and so forth uh, that were not always true. You had supposedly groups who were Vietnam vets, who were not always Vietnam vets, uh, getting up and saying things. Uh, it's just like the on the wall, uh, who was the first person to die? Let's see. I think there's four different people uh, who listed as the first people to die during the Vietnam War. Actually, the first guy that died is not even on the wall because the wall was um, uh, was not it doesn't go back that far. And if you look at the wall, it does up at, at the beginning of the wall, it says 1959 up at the top. But if you look up the names, the first names go back to 1957. That was two years before the 59 that's on the wall. And we also look at the end of the war, 1975, and there's 40, there's 40 some men who were uh, killed in action during the uh, uh, Cambodian uh, Maquez uh, situation, incident, and uh, they're on the wall. So, so there's so many different uh, situations there. Uh, when did the war start? Uh, the government has five or six different dates. So it's sometimes it's really hard to go out there and do research for a show uh, and to uh, get the right information and so forth. I guess that's the same problem that uh, Mr. Burns had when he was doing his uh, uh, 16 hours or whatever it was of the uh, Vietnam War documentary. He had the same problem. Uh, unfortunately, I, I know that he did use some information that was not quite uh, kosher, but um, uh, maybe that was the best he could do. But it's out there. So if you know someone, uh, encourage them to come in and watch the show, call in sometime and, and straighten me out. If I have a guest and you don't think what they're saying, uh, it's, it's, that's okay. Uh, call in and let us know because basically we were in Vietnam right at 15 years. Of those 15 years, we all were there for a year, basically. And th things changed every year as far as even where we were. I was at a place called Long Men, 20 miles, and we said a while ago from Saigon. And the long bend I was at in 67, 68 was nowhere near the long bend that was there in 72, 73 when it was turned over to the South Vietnamese. Uh, so depending on what year you were there, what job, uh, and so forth, all of our stories are, are different. We saw things different. You, you know, we could sometimes witnesses, uh, four or five witnesses saw the same thing and see it differently. And that's the problem with the Vietnam War. You had, we all saw a little bit at the time. We didn't know the big picture. You had war protesters back home that was making uh, stuff. All the books and, and, and movies that came out about the Vietnam War, who uh, uh, had all the cliches in the world. And they were, they, the American people, uh, far and large, had their own idea of how the Vietnam War was and, 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 was, and was fought and so forth. Unfortunately, uh, because of the books and magazines and news media and movies and so forth, it's, it's not always the truth. And uh, everybody's entitled to their own uh, facts and figures, but everybody's not, uh, you know, and their own opinion. Uh, but let people know it's your opinion and not, uh, and not necessarily uh, the factual opinion. So uh, looking forward to uh, the next show. Hope you enjoyed the Dogs of, uh, the dogs of War. Uh, those people, those uh, dogs, remember them uh, out there uh, tonight. And when you uh, uh, go after the show, uh, you go love up on your dog and, and tell them how much you appreciate uh, their loyalty and love and, and respect for them out there. And uh, Amnon, you want to uh, say something? Well, we got, I got, we got a couple more minutes and I just wanted to, um, you, you pretty, you and your dog are pretty close. And uh, I, just, yeah. I, I just can, I, it just blows me away thinking about, I, 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 I really don't understand how, how they could do that. I mean, somebody in, ought, ought to pay today for what, for these. Yeah. That's atrocity. Well, and, 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 and then making the handler hold the dog yeah, I know. Yeah. To, to be euthanized. And the, 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 motor, the, the motorcycle going down the road with the, with the dogs, uh, 
uh, yeah, th- didn't help a whole lot. And, um, uh, yeah. So that's, uh, uh, our government does strange things. If you hadn't noticed, uh, and quite often the military is where they do a lot of their, uh, weird things, uh, for and to, and, uh, it, the Vietnam War itself, as, as Richard Nixon says, was the most misunderstood and misjudged uh, war. In the, At least had. they learned from it, and today things changed. Yeah. Well, so, everything, everything about the Vietnam War they learn about because today the way they treat the soldiers, uh, the military coming home, uh, everything has changed. The uh, post-traumatic stress, now uh, almost everybody is uh, come back, coming back now is basically – uh, diagnosed with post-traumatic stress. Uh, when we came back, there was no such thing as we, it was just us crazy vets, uh, vets and so forth. So, uh, you know, we paid the price for it, but if that's what it took for the, no. you got to look at the silver lining. Yeah. You know, the, the way the troops are treated today, uh, you don't, you don't see hear people, uh, telling, you know, uh, vets coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, why didn't, why didn't you stay or why did you come back and yeah. so forth or, are calling your names and, and baby killers and so forth. So we have uh, gained a lot. Um, it's tragic that the, you know, like the dogs and so forth had to pay the price. Uh, uh, they paid the ultimate price. And it's, it would be interesting. Uh, you know, it's, it's like the Vietnam Memorial wall. If you put up all the names of all the people who have died as a result of the Vietnam war since the war, you need at least one more wall, if not two more walls. And also, it would be it would be nice, but you can't keep right on going. Uh, a wall with the do- with the dogs on it, but m- quite often, all we know about the dogs, uh, it all would be a number, since they had that number tattooed on their ear and so forth. But uh, uh, enough rambling on and so forth. Uh, thank you for watching the show, and we hope you had some value to you and didn't make you too mad about where the dogs were. And, uh, we learn from it. If you wish to see this show and any other previous shows, just log in on www.nissancommunications.com live slash live and select on demand and, and choose your show. There's a lot of good shows out there. The ones with guests and so forth. Tell your friends about if you like the show and if you didn't like the show, tell me and I'll try to get, uh, we'll try to, uh, make it work next time. Again, our next show will be June 24th, eight o'clock in the evening. And we look forward to having you all come back with us and bring a friend. Our guest will be Arthur and uh, Vietnam veteran John Harrison. And I believe John was an, uh, came back from Vietnam, became an attorney. And now he's the author of Still Rain, the Tet Offense of 1968. Uh, that's another uh, interesting story, the 68 Tet Offensive, how we won the battle and lost the war or during the Tet Offensive. And maybe he'll talk a little bit about that. And y'all have a good evening. And Wherever you are, it's probably hot like it is here. Uh, Stay cool and dry. Thank y'all. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.